Hi friends, this is John and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. Welcome back. I should mention that if you haven't listened to some of our earlier episodes, I probably wasn't as good an interviewer then as I am now. I've certainly become a bit more comfortable with practice, but we had some incredible guests early on that have some incredible content. I'd encourage you to go back and, uh, and listen to those if you haven't. But here in the podcast, we generally focus on agronomy and agronomic science and cultural management practices and those types of related pieces with a specific emphasis on regenerating soil health and plant health and public health and all the things that we care about. I'm really excited to have as my guest for this show, Paul Grieve from Pasture Bird. Uh, if you haven't heard about Paul and his work, uh, where have you been? Hiding under a rock somewhere. Because Paul and his team have been doing some really interesting stuff. I've been observing from a distance for the last couple of years. I'm really intrigued and impressed and uh, excited by the potential of what might come in the future. So Paul, thank you for being here. Thanks for all the work that you do. And uh, why don't you tell us the background, the story, a little bit about what you're up to, what you're working on, and how you got here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me, John. Thanks for all the kind words. I'm glad that you said team. This is definitely, um, I'm the one who goes on the podcast, but there's a large crew all working on these things as, as you know there's a there's always a lot of people behind the operation so I'm, I'm just one person on the team but uh it's been it's been a journey god's had me on a ride um for about the last 11 years uh, and maybe it goes back even a few years before that uh, i really came to this in an unconventional way after college i was a college athlete and after college i went into the marine corps and i was in sniper school in quantico virginia where I contracted Lyme disease from a tick from just laying out in the woods for too long. And I started to get some really odd adverse health consequences from that. It was the kind of thing where you're feeling great one day and the next day you've got brain fog and fatigue and you've got achy joints and you've just got all these weird things that you didn't think that, that would be possible as a 22 year old. Thankfully, the whole paleo and eating like a caveman sort of thing was all happening in the military at that time. And I had a few friends said, you know, if you, if you want to feel better, you should really think about what you're putting into your body. Uh, and I'd never thought about that in my whole life, you know, growing up in the eighties and the nineties as a McDonald's kid. And I just had never thought about the idea that food could make you feel any different. But lo and behold, I did clean up my diet, started feeling a lot better. And when I came home from Iraq in 2009, my family really went on a tear of trying to find local organic produce and vegetables, grass fed, uh, grass finished, you know, meat and beef and lamb and pasture raised chicken. And the one thing that we just could not find was pasture raised chicken anywhere. And so that's really where the story begins. That's a fascinating start to the story. You know, I find it interesting how many of the regenerative agriculture landscape as it exists today, there are many perhaps early adopters that are now starting to join the innovators and they're starting to see the, the trend of the future that is coming. But it's an interesting percentage of people, a very high percentage of the people who were the innovators who were early in the space came to it as a result of some type of stress or duress. For some of them, it was financial duress. And for many of them, it was a health challenge, exactly as what you described in your experience. I was listening to Will Harris, who's a guy that we've also modeled a lot of what we do after, and just an interesting, uh, interesting man and a real pioneer in regenerative ag. He had a comment. He said, the only way to drive change is through pain. And I was thinking, That's, I don't know if I totally agree with that or not, but man, it sure does seem like oftentimes you have to suffer to really necessitate change. And, and uh, that's where I think God was doing a work with the sort of health stuff that was going on with my family. My father-in-law actually lost like a hundred pounds, you know, and, uh, and that, that bit of pain, I think drove really where we are today. Well, I think it's the default setting for most people. Like there, there are some special characters who gain energy and thrive from leaning into large challenges. Yeah. But the default for most people is to seek comfort and to be comfortable. And if the status quo is comfortable, change is uncomfortable, and so therefore tend not to change. And so it's it's for that reason that, uh, yeah, I think for many people, pain is a prerequisite to considering making at least making significant changes. Many people are might stumble into incremental change, but making right. significant change doesn't happen easily for most people. 
Yeah, I mean, my wife and I were living this very normal lifestyle. We were living in Newport Beach, had a good salary. You know, this is after the military now. I was working as an accountant. She was working as interior designer, had a nice little cottage close to the beach. And by all accounts, you wouldn't really have a good reason to walk away from that. Move in with your in-laws. You know, at one point, nine of us were living in a 1,700 square foot house. So just to back up a little bit, the story goes, you know, couldn't find pastured poultry. Searched high and low, farmers markets, grocery stores, just struck out everywhere. We got really interested in the work of Joel Salatin out of the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. And we thought, you know what? What would it be like to just raise some birds in our backyard? And we ordered 50 chicks on a whim with no experience and no knowledge of anything. We read about half of pastured poultry profits, which is one of our kind of go-to references for, for doing pastured poultry. The 50 birds came and we gave it a shot and, and we we're really impressed by um, this idea of moving animals to fresh pasture every day. For me as a kid growing up in Seattle, I consider myself not a hippie environmentalist, but somebody who cares deeply about the environment. And as a Christian, just stewarding land and trying to steward uh, resources as well. All I ever heard was that the best thing you could do would be to not have animals in the ecosystem. And it just never made that much sense to me because I knew God created animals for a reason. Joel was the first time I thought about this idea that actually animals managed properly or in their wild state are a benefit to the environment. And animals played feed plants and plants feed animals. And it's actually a beautifully designed system. And so that's what really got me intrigued was this idea that we can produce nutrient dense food uh, raise high animal welfare, but also be like a benefit to the environment. And that was the trifecta for me that said, I'm going to go for it, get the 50 birds, kind of do the whole thing. As 50 became 100, became 200, became 500, we found ourselves, you know, leaving our cush day job and moving in with the in-laws and just trying to get this little baby farm off of the ground and uh, reinvest all the profits, backyard processing, you know, the whole the whole story. I really wonder how many farmers Joel Salatin has launched with that little book, Pasture Poultry Profits. I bet it's more than a hundred or two. It's probably more than a couple thousand in reality. It's, I'm sure it's quite a number. I bet the number's in the thousands, yeah. You touched on an important point of the idea of the environmentalist perspective of livestock and humans in the landscape versus a Christian stewardship perspective. And there are these two kind of diametrically opposed views where one of them holds that the best way to regenerate landscapes is to remove people from the landscape. And the other point of view is that the fastest way to accelerate regeneration of landscapes is to have more people who have a caring, loving stewardship relationship with the land. And that as a hyper keystone species, they can accelerate regeneration faster by far, by orders of magnitude than anything else you might do. I mean, why do we exist? You know, it comes back to a pretty fundamental question. Uh, whether you believe in evolution or creation, why the heck are we here if it's not to be a positive impact on, on the land and to bring order into chaos? I mean, I think that's a huge part of why we even exist as a species. It's not just to consume resources. There's no creation or evolution that's just a pure consumer. I mean, we have to have some kind of a beneficial role in our optimal state. I, I really think that um, this movement into automation and removing people from the land is, is really, honestly, it's a sad state of affairs. I don't think it's our optimal uh, well-being, that's for sure. Well, it is uh, resulting indirectly, or perhaps directly, you could argue, resulting in the degradation of landscapes. Agreed. The fact that you are removing people from the land means that you're removing care and love from the land, and uh, that is just accelerating all of the bad habits or providing a pathway for all the bad habits that lead to degradation to become dominant. Well, you take a 10,000 head feedlot, or you take a 10,000 acre kind of monocrop corn facility. And I always preface all this. This is not a knock against the farmers that are running those systems at all. And I think that there's great people doing lots of different styles and all that stuff. But traditionally, right, we had about three men tending an acre of land. And you walk onto that 10,000 acres of corn where you see massive amounts of runoff and you see lots of leaching and you see lots of, you know, chemical fertilizers being applied. And it's like, man, if we, if we had three people that main part of their life, I mean, eight, eight 
to 12 hours a day or spent caring for that one acre? If you had three people doing that, what would each of those acres look like? It wouldn't look like that. Definitely wouldn't look like that. Well, there's this mantra that we need to grow food to feed the world. And at the same time, 40% of all of our corn production is going into ethanol. There's biodiesel production. There's just a, a really wonky scenario. And like we need to recognize that there is very little substance and truth in the feeding the world mantra the way it's commonly used here in North America. Because the reality is most of the world doesn't consume primarily corn and soybeans. And what I've found odd or interesting or whatever with I feel like the, the journey that God's really taken me on is I'm a huge passionate believer in small scale local food systems where you do have three people paying attention to every single acre and this integration of community and farming and the intersection of you know these beautiful things that really only happen on a small scale local food sector but then also straddle this really odd world where we're also working with one of the largest chicken companies in the country to try to improve an authentic model of doing pasture raise at scale to try to make real pasture raised poultry more accessible and more affordable for people and put it into large scale retail and do it on a scale that can be a fertility program for those corn and soybean fields. So it's, it's this weird dichotomy and it's almost like it could sound like I'm a conflicted person if I don't have the chance to sort of explain the story <laughs> of how, how we even got there in the first place. But God's really put me in this place where I feel like, yes, small scale local food is really important, but improving the way that big ag and large scale poultry happens and to see another model pioneered there, I also think is really important if we want to leave it better for the broader, you know, next generation that comes behind us. Totally. The way we should think about it is that if we had those localized, regionalized food systems that are the ideal that people would hold, an ideal vision that people hold in front of us, such a model internalizes many costs that are presently externalized. Agreed. Which means that food produced in those ecosystems is inherently more expensive. Now, arguably, it's more valuable from many different perspectives. But right. we... We also have to acknowledge the reality that it costs more in dollars and cents that many people may not be able to justify or may not be able to afford. And so the the value that I see is, as Buckminster Fuller said, you, you, don't, you don't change something by fighting against it. You replace it with a better model and a better system. And that is really what I see happening with you and the work that you're doing with, with Pasture Bird and collaborating with Purdue. So... Tell us a little bit about that. From the 500 chickens, what uh, what was the remainder of the pathway that got you to the work that you're doing today? Well, we were very, what I would call it, uh, not traditional. The right word is probably a classic, small-scale, Salatin-inspired, direct-to-consumer farm. We started with all, all on farm pickups, realized that convenience had to be one of the legs on the stool if we wanted to actually have a regenerative financial situation happening. Um, so we started to really focus on convenience and quality because we knew we couldn't compete on price. And I've always felt like you need two of those three legs kind of for the stool to even be able to have a chance to stand, right? We realized convenience would be a, a big spot for us. So we started to offer pickup sites where we would drive around and people would meet us at specific locations around Southern California. I should mention we've always been in Southern California. That's where we really started, where we've been from. And we've tried to focus on how can we be successful in our context because our context is very different than Ohio or Pennsylvania or Florida. Uh, we've got 26 million people within an hour and a half of the farm. A lot of those people are interested in health and wellness and connectivity to farm, but they don't have any kind of farming background themselves. So then we offered, started offering um, home delivery eventually, where we'd load up a bunch of cars and we'd drive product directly to people's houses. So we've been on this journey of convenience. But what happened at our very small scale is we started to feel like we're producing food for rich people and none of us were ever rich growing up. And so it felt like this really weird position to be in where we're raising meat. I mean, we were in chicken, lamb, beef, pork. We even started sourcing some, some wild fish, you know, aggregating and producing kind of a combination of both. Um, but we were producing and selling food that our parents could have never afforded growing up. And that just started to feel really weird. And so we thought, 
is there a way to pick one of these four or five species and to get really good at it? So instead of being a generalist that's sort of doing everything and it's really expensive, is there an opportunity for us to get really good at maybe beef cattle or maybe we do dairy or maybe we do poultry? And, and as we did our what we call a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, we had really expensive land. We didn't have a lot of water being in Southern California, but we did have a year round growing season. And we had USDA certified processing only an hour from the farm that we had access to. And after talking to a lot of poultry farmers, they didn't have that. It was a, one of the biggest holdups for people was that they didn't have USDA certified processing, which is what would allow us to kind of scale. So we made essentially a family meeting. We made this decision that we're going to try to get really good at poultry and see if we can impact the broader poultry industry. And bring some scale into it to make things more accessible and more affordable. And that's really what sent us on the journey of going from primal pastures, which was the mixed livestock family business doing home delivery to focusing on pasture bird, which is the largest pastured poultry producer in the world. And we've pioneered these 7,000 square foot, fully autonomous, solar powered, mobile chicken coops that drive birds to fresh pastures. So I can tell more about the story in between, but that's really uh, the genesis of what we were doing. 7,000 square foot autonomous robots moving birds to fresh pasture every day. It sounds like a pretty interesting story. Let's hear a bit more about that. <laughs> when we're thinking about how to scale and to bring costs down for pasture poultry, we'd already had about five years of experience moving mobile coops to fresh grass all the time. It started with the Salatin system of like a 10 foot by 12 foot, two foot high mobile coop where the birds are living on the ground all the time. And your, your, your listeners are likely familiar with the Salatin style. Next, we moved up to a tractor pull system, which is a, a greenhouse on skids, 600 bird, about a 720 square foot. It's like a 26, I think it was like a 26 by 30 or 36 or 40, something in there, but it worked out to 720 square feet. Move those every 24 hours. In our climate, we can do that year round. Huge advantage to be in poultry and to be able to go year round. That's really what we needed to start working with the chefs and to start thinking about retail sales into grocery. But it's extremely labor intensive. So even with the tractor pull 600 bird system, we had about a dollar per bird just in labor, wow. just from moving the coops around. The industry has five, three to five cents in labor, right? So it was like, this doesn't increase the welfare of the bird. It doesn't increase the nutrient density of the product. It does nothing really beneficial. It just costs us more to do it this way. So we started thinking, is there a way to streamline? And as much as we were, I would say we hated big ag. Like it was fundamentally antithetical to what we were trying to build and what we were trying to pioneer. But as we started to focus on scale, it's like as much as we dislike and we have a distaste for all these things, are there things that we could learn? Efficiencies that they've picked up over 50, 60 years of industrializing the food system. Is there something that we can glean to incorporate in our system to make it better? You know, And so we started to look at, well, why are they so effective? Look at the poultry barn, the, the classic Western kind of 60 year poultry barn is a about a 600 foot by 40 foot wide. So about 24,000 birds inside of each one. Everything's automated from the climate control to the fans, to the curtains, to the feed delivery and the water delivery. It's all 100% automated. The only thing that a human needs to go in and do is they walk through the house and they find dead birds and they pull them out. You know, So everything else is automated. And they're even talking about automating that eventually. And so we started thinking, how do we take the best of the best from that but put it into a mobile system that would move birds to fresh pasture every 24 hours at the stocking density that we like to get the manure impact that we really want. And it came back to size. You can't justify investing in automated feed and automated water and automated curtain climate technology on 600 birds. It never pencils out. But if you can 10 X that and you, and you amortize that over 6,000 birds, well, now a lot more possibility opens up for automation. So that was really the why. The reason why we went to 6,000 is because that's what the industry puts on a semi-truck. So 
we thought eventually we need to be operating at the same scale that the industry does. So what are they doing? How does their numbers work? How does this all work? And it just so happens that 6,000 what is what gets picked up from the farm and brought to the plant. So, you know, for years we're backyard processing, you know, doing a hundred birds or 150 birds, our whole family's out there, you know, but we knew to make this efficient and to make it cost effective, you can't be doing backyard processing or small scale processing. You need to plug into the large scale industrial processors. And you could say that's good or bad. There, there's honestly pros and cons to it, but 6,000 became our number because that's what needs to go into the processor. Well, if you want to feed the millions of people that are within an hour and a half of you, then uh, that's not going to happen at a small scale and in processing or in, or in land footprint either for that matter. So you described your historical worldview as kind of being the, the antithesis or 180 degrees away from the Purdue's of the world, and yet you find yourself in a partnership with Purdue. How did that come about? A lot of prayer and a lot of uh, family meetings and a lot of petition. But I think starting in 2015, we realized if we want to, my goal is not to feed the world either, even with pasture bird. We want to raise a million chickens a week on pasture. That's the dream. We're a long, long, long ways from it right now. But to make pasture poultry, nutrient dense chicken more accessible and affordable in retail. But as you back up into like 2015, 2016, we realize that either we're going to spend 50 to a hundred million dollars building our own hatchery feed mill slaughterhouse logistics and, and distribution infrastructure if we want to sell into retail and play like the big boys play or and, and in order to do that taking on massive amount of debt massive amount of capital you know investment that we just don't have or you could team up with a company who already has all those things and you could bring them this pastured model, but plug into their hatchery, plug into their feed mill, plug into their you know logistics and slaughterhouse and distribution capabilities that already exist. And I've never been interested in running a slaughterhouse. I have enough experience with backyard processing to know that just is not a strength of mine, is not really an interest of mine either. And so pretty much in 16 and 17, we started thinking the ideal outcome would be for us to get really good at the coop and really figure out how to build a large scale, autonomous, off the grid mobile coop and to outsource the rest of this to a poultry partner that knows the processing side of the business is really good at that. I didn't think we were gonna team up with Purdue because we really didn't know Purdue. Being West Coast guys, they're just not, they don't have a huge presence on the West and, um, I didn't have a lot of familiarity with their company, but we were, we were actually approached by Purdue in 2018. And they came to us and they said, we have a big interest in this regenerative ag movement. You may not realize it, but we've actually done a lot pioneering and pushing the industry forward with respect to uh, no antibiotic ever chicken. They were the first to really do large scale certified organic chicken. They acquired Nyman Ranch, which is, in my opinion, one of the best large scale, you know, national footprint hog operations uh, in the country. They take good care of their farmers. They pay a fair price. Uh, and so and then they had Panorama grass fed beef as well. And, they, and after really looking at that and realizing that of the big industry guys, if we were going to team up with one, Purdue made the most sense by a long shot um, because of what they've done for the last 10 to 20 years. We had a chance to meet all their executive team. They shared that something really interesting to me, there's a massive loophole within labeling right now. They could take millions of birds a week and slap a pasture raised label on them and it would be perfectly legal. They could do that and they could sell it in retail. And they said, look, we don't want to do that. We want to do authentic, legitimate, daily move pasture poultry. If we're gonna do, if we're gonna go into this space, we wanna do it for real. And I just had a lot of respect for that because it's not really what you would think coming from a big ag company. All you ever hear is the horror stories and, and how they're, you know, these guys are just Satan worshipers and all they're in it for is the buck and the profit. And <laughs> oh it's my, like, oh my, <laughs> that's all. That's, I mean, it's, it's a lot of what we heard, at least coming up in the space. And as we got to know the people that actually work there, uh, it was clear that they were actually really good people and uh and they were responding to consumer demand i mean that's how we got this big 
factory farm cheap chicken thing in the first place. People demanded really, really cheap chicken. And now that the consumer is demanding something different, they want to produce what consumers are asking for. So they're asking for regeneratively raised products, pasture raised products, and more nutrient dense products. And Purdue's sitting here going, we don't want to do the fake version of that. We want to do the real thing. Mm -hmm. And their interests were genuine. And we had a chance to really meet the family and meet the team. And it's not a publicly traded company. It's a family owned business. And for that and other, you know, two more years of conversation and back and forth, we decided that they were the right partner to try to do this at scale with. That's really encouraging. And, uh, you know, we hear the horror stories and we often don't hear the stories of people trying to do the right thing. And yet I find this entire space, this entire industry filled with many organizations and many individuals within large organizations who truly authentically want to do the right thing. And so I've shared this mantra that regeneration at its most fundamental level is about regenerating relationships and shifting from transactional extractive relationships to symbiotic and synergistic and collaborative relationships. And for all of us as farmers in the farming community, we should seek out those types of relationships with our input providers and with uh, offtake and just I think that's that's exactly what you've been able to develop with Purdue and to do that requires stripping forward in trust at some point like yeah. you can try to verify you can try to do your research your homework to be very well prepared but at some point you have to step forward and be vulnerable and uh, that's something that and I'm bringing this up because I have the sense that this is something that many people are afraid to do. They're afraid to step forward and be vulnerable. And so they remain stuck and good opportunities pass them by. I was impressed by even Purdue's vulnerability. I mean, to come as a, as a massive multi-billion dollar multinational company with 20 plus thousand employees and to come to our backyard style operation to go, hey, you know, we need your help. I mean, that, that takes a lot of humility for a large company to approach a small company and, and to say something like that. So I felt like they were really vulnerable in the situation as well. They even have a saying at their company or our company now, because I'm, I'm working for them. We're not too chicken to change, you know, and <laughs> it's not easy to be in business for a hundred plus years uh, and to still maintain that kind of a philosophy. So I, I was just, I, re I remain impressed by them and your I would argue that's the only way you stay in business for a hundred years. <laughs> agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned uh, a bit ago, and I'm not sure if it, uh, the the numbers that you shared were per pound or per chicken. That your labor costs were like a dollar per bird, as compared to three to five cents per bird, or maybe that was per pound. I'm not sure. Certain per bird. Um, per bird. So what have you been able to achieve with your autonomous robots? How has that shifted? Yeah, so to back up a little bit, in case people haven't really seen uh, the automated range coop, we call it the ARC or the ARC for short. It's a 150 foot long, 50 foot wide. One of the big breakthroughs is that forever in the, in the pasture poultry industry, we're using greenhouse style structures and we're essentially moving them on the long axis, if that makes sense. So if your coop was 36 by 20, you're moving those birds 36 feet every day instead of moving them 20 feet. And as you get bigger and bigger, you're not getting a broiler chicken to walk 150 feet in one shot. It's just not gonna happen. So it sounds really simple, but one of the big breakthroughs was, wait, we're moving it the wrong way. We need to start moving it on the short axis, not the long axis. We're also out in the middle of nowhere on these ranches and farms. So how do you, you know, driving a tractor out, at one point, we had 77 mobile range coops. That's the 600 bird model. We're moving birds for eight hours a day, causing all sorts of compaction in the field, driving these huge tractors around. And we're trying to grow a really healthy, you know, we're trying to heal soil and grow pasture. So that didn't really make sense either. So it became, how do we, how do we more efficiently move these birds to fresh pasture? Well, instead of driving a tractor out there, why don't we get the coop to just drive itself? That would be way cooler, right? So now we outfitted all these coops with solar power because we don't have a we don't have a cord that's going to run from from the farmhouse all the way out to the middle of the field, and then we outfitted them with about 26, 26 electric drive motors that would actually drive the system to to fresh pasture itself every day, so that we don't have to have you know 
tractors driving out all the time. Outfitted them with very modern, the most modern from the industrial system, feed pans and water lines and silos. That was really, really important learning that we took from the industry. Why? At one point, we had 500 buckets of feed every day that we were filling up, putting in a truck and driving out to the field and dumping them into the coops. That doesn't improve the welfare of the bird. It doesn't improve welfare of the worker. It doesn't help anything. You know, it creates jobs. That's about it. But they're not even necessarily very fun jobs. And so now we fill up a silo three times throughout the life of the bird. And that silo uses solar power to auger feed into the feed pans, just like it does in an industrial style chicken house. Same thing with the water line. Pressurized water line hits the house, fills up nipples throughout the entire house, and the birds have the right ratio of birds to to nipple line. Same thing with the climate control. So one of the big struggles within pastured poultry is we have zero climate control, especially in the Salatin system. As we got bigger and we went from 600 to 6,000, now we can invest in thermostatic controls that run off of our solar power to raise and lower curtains, turn fans on and off in the drier climate, like in California, engage misting systems to throw water down onto the coops or onto the birds. Doesn't really work as well in Georgia because we're in a humid climate there, but it's all about stir fans and keeping the air moving. But those were really the principles that we took from industrial ag and applied them to these mobile systems. So it was like, how do we take all the good things from industrial poultry farming and put them into a chassis that will drive itself to fresh grass all the time. And from that, we've taken our labor costs down by about 10 X. So we're down into that 10 kind of 10 cent range where we're obviously not as cheap as the industry is, nor will we ever be because we're not in a stationary system, but we're much closer, much more within striking distance now. Yeah. That's a very reasonable distance. That's quite an accomplishment. So tell me a bit more about the ARC. You have 7,500 square feet, if my math is correct, and you have 26 drive wheels on it uh, or drive engines. So, And you also mentioned silo capacity. I've got all kinds of questions that pop into my mind. So if you're refilling, how, how large is your silo capacity and what is the compaction impact that you have relative to the tractors that we're driving across the field? Well, I mean, so you're taking all that weight and you're spreading it over 7,500 square feet instead of putting it all underneath you know, the tractor tires. And so you're, you're spreading it out incredibly uh, as far as compaction goes. Well, you'd still be concentrating it under, underneath the transport wheels though, no? Yeah, but we have, we have 52 wheels now instead of two or four, I guess. Interesting. Okay. And really more like 104 because there's a lot of dually tires on there too. So you see almost no compaction now compared to what we originally had. You're going to get a little bit more underneath where the silos are. So those are two five ton tanks and those need to be refilled three times throughout the course uh, of the bird's life. Another huge learning that we had is your listeners that have done poultry farming before know that brooding is really the name of the game. If you can get a healthy bird out of the brooder, because you don't start baby chicks in a, in a pasture system, they need to start in a fixed system in a brooder for the first two to three weeks, they need to be in a full climate control, wood chip bedding, heat lamps, you know, propane heater, whatever. We wrestled with brooding for seven years, trying to figure out what is the ultimate best environment for brooding birds. How do you keep them warm and dry and good feed? And just if you get a good, healthy bird out of the brooder, if you're at 1.6, 1.8 pounds after three weeks, I can almost guarantee you're going to have low mortality and you're going to have a good grow out once you get them on a pasture. If you don't have it though, if you're under a pound, if you've got high mortality in the brooder, there's nothing you can do in the pasture to make up for it. So brooding is critical to the success of raising pasture poultry at small scale or big scale. It doesn't matter. But we're scratching our heads, trying to figure out shipping containers and portable sheds and building brooders. And we finally said, you know what's actually the best brooder in the entire world? You know who's spent the most time and energy figuring out how to take care of a baby chick? It's the poultry industry, the large scale poultry industry with their poultry barns. And so what we really realize is they've really perfected how to take a bird from zero days to 18 days, which is our brooding period. And so it was another benefit of working with Purdue is that now we can plug into their conventional stationary poultry houses that have ventilation 
and they have the perfect bedding. They have all the perfect feed deployment to take advantage of that and to put out a really high quality bird before going into the arc. Because like I said, it doesn't matter how great your arc is. If you don't have a good brooded, brooded bird going in, it's like having bad, you know, bad plant transplant. If those seeds aren't good, if they're not germinating right, you can put them into the perfect soil out in the field. It's not going to fix anything. They're never going to recover from that. Paul, I'm trying to do a mental math here, and I'm just imagining a greenhouse structure, solar panels, batteries, engines, 104 wheels. You kind of had me doing a double take there. So you've been... Well, no engines, just motors. A motor, sorry. In the industry, there have been all of these iterations, and particularly here within the Amish and Mennonite communities, there are now... I don't know, probably half a dozen or more vendors who are building aluminum coops and all types of metal and wire cages that are uh, iterations of the Salatin style that are intended to be easier to move. Yep. And they are flipping expensive. Yep. And uh, my constant critique when I'm asked for my opinion is, uh, what's the CapEx cost per bird? And so that's my question to you. So one thing that we're not currently publishing is the cost of the ARC but I can share a bunch of information about it other than saying what it, it exactly is. And that's just because we're still in development. We're, we're still evaluating. Maybe we sell them someday. Maybe we don't, maybe we license. We don't really know what we're going to do at some point, but the big effect on CapEx is amortization time. So if your coop only lasts you three years and you're in a climate where you can only put up four or five flocks a year per coop, that's very different than being in a sunbelt state where I can run 12 flocks a year because the birds are only in there for three weeks. And then I lay out the coop for a week and then I'm right back in it with another 6,000 birds. So I've got 12 flocks a year and- Hang on, why do, you, why do you lay out the coop for a week? I mean, we really don't need to. We could put birds in it the next day. We like to go through and preventative maintenance, all the feed pans or water lines, You know, spray out any kind of dander, have a chance to touch up any kind of, uh, you know, wheel issues, reset the coop often. It's nice to not be right in that next spot. Sometimes we strategically want to be in a different place okay. in the field. Got it. We don't need a week, but we like to build in that week of buffer time. Got it. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. You were on a flow. No, that's okay. What I was going to say as well is when we go from having a three-year life of that coop and five flocks a year. So, you know, that's, that's 15 flocks total for that, for that whole life to go into 12 flocks a year and a 10-year life. Now you have 120 flocks that's being amortized over that same CapEx. It just changes the, the cost per pound or the cost per bird substantially. So we're thinking a lot about how long is the useful life of these coops? What's the kind of disposal value of them? Uh, it's obviously a higher cost per bird than the industry. What I could say is it's about double um, the housing cost per bird of the industry. But the housing cost in the industry is a small, tiny, tiny fraction of the feed cost. And our feed cost is just about the same. Exactly. I mean, if you have, you're within striking distance on labor costs and you're within striking distance on housing costs, you are all of a sudden very affordable to mainstream consumers, which is really exciting. Well, you wouldn't think that double would be striking distance, but you have to understand how small of a percentage housing and labor is exactly. of the cost of a bird. So your number one cost by a long shot is feed, right? And one of the misconceptions is that we could have a better feed conversion than the industry. It's actually not true. Um, because we don't have climate control and because the birds are moving around every single day. I mean, what you're shooting for is industry standard feed conversion rates. That's great if you can get there. Most folks are a little higher. So it's taking a little bit more feed to produce the same pounds of, of chicken only because they're moving around a lot more. Obviously, that gets thrown way off if you start using an alternative breed or some kind of a slow growth breed that goes out of the window and, and you're very uncompetitive at that point. So what we're doing with pasture bird right now is the Cobb 500. And part of me loves that and part of me hates it. You know, the Cobb bird is a very fragile bird. It's a it's a challenging bird to raise on pasture. I think we're very good at it now. Uh, it's not necessarily the bird you always want to start on. We love raising the Freedom Rangers for six, seven years. We did the Freedom Rangers out of Pennsylvania, and it's a really hardy bird. It's a better beginner bird, I would say, but you're not getting the feed conversion. You're not getting the yield. So if you want to be cost competitive, if that's a really important part of your business model, 
the Freedom Ranger is a really difficult one to run. Yep. All important pieces if you want to scale to mil a million bird a million birds a week. Right. If I followed the numbers that you shared correctly, I, I seem to recall you describing the industry housing, the stationary housing, to be 24,000 birds and 24,000 square feet, which is a square foot per bird. And if my mental math is correct, you're at 6,000 birds and 7,500 square feet. So you're actually providing more space as well. How did you arrive at that uh, stocking density? And, and you also... Uh, earlier in our conversation, you managed a key word or key phrase that I can't recall having heard before, and that is a manure impact. What is the manure impact that you're targeting? Well, I think you're already picking up on what I'm saying because our stocking density is driven off of manure impact. So we want not too much, not too little manure going down every single day. A chicken poops about two and a half pounds of manure over the course of its life. And so there's been lots of studies done to optimize stocking density based on the manure load that you want and the rest time that you're ready to give. We build everything very close to the Joel Salatin model of that one and a quarter to one and a half square feet per bird per day. So that's the key difference is when the industry says, well, we have one square foot per bird and we say, well, we have one and a quarter square foot per bird. It sounds like we're giving them 25% more space, but the difference is we're giving them a new one and a quarter square feet every single day. And that has everything to do with that regenerative amount of manure that we want going down based on an average 90 day rest period in between grazing cycles. So it's a very long rest cycle. And when you come out to one of our farms, what you see is green grass everywhere with a few little white coops dotted out in the landscape. And everybody who doesn't know what we're doing says, man, why don't you guys add a bunch more coops here? And just like anybody who's listening to this knows, you can quickly go to degenerative when you have too much manure load. And um, everything that we've done has been built off of that, combined with animal welfare, combined with sort of optimal, you know, livability rates and, and whatnot. So the one and a quarter square foot to one and a half square foot, which is where we like to be, is really calculated off of that regenerative manure impact. What has, as you have changed uh, the scale of housing from 100 birds to 600 birds to now 6,000 birds. What has changed with uh, pest pressure, if anything? What has changed with management? Like, have, have you noticed any distinct um, changes in management that need to take place? Do you have more fly pressure, for example? What are some of the things that, he, that you've noticed? What's crazy, and it may not even sound like I'm telling the truth, but I am, is, is there isn't any changes. So the same issues that we faced at 80 birds with that stocking density and moving them every single day and having a 90 day rest period are the exact same issues that we have with 6,000 birds with the same stocking density and rest period. So from that aspect, it's really scalable. The only thing that I could say is with the larger coops, it affords us the ability to do something like running a hot wire three to four inches off the ground along the base of the coop to prevent something like a ground predator from coming in. Because we're again, amortizing that cost over 6,000 birds and the cost of wire is really cheap. It's really just the charger that's gonna cost you the money and to be able to split that cost over a lot more birds makes it a lot easier to justify the investment. My thoughts are going in about a dozen places at once and I'm trying to think of what the important question is. So um, I'm going to flip it back to you and ask the question, what is, the, um, what is it that you believe other farmers and entrepreneurs should know about the potential or the opportunity of the system? and also any potential pitfalls that it might have. Well, let's talk about this. So we, we don't like to call ourselves regenerative yet. The big reason why not is because you have, you have a very regenerative impact happening where we're raising the poultry. And we have unbelievable pictures and videos and soil samples and tests, and that's, that's beautiful. But our feed all still comes from industrial monocrop corn and soybean fields. And I want to give credit where credit's due for the people truly doing regenerative agriculture, uh, whether it's small scale or large scale, mostly done with ruminant animals at this point, in my opinion. To really call a system like this regenerative would require the feed to be grown also in a regenerative manner with regenerative outcomes. And we are not there yet. So I want to make that very clear that we haven't arrived we haven't achieved all of our goals. We've got a lot of work still to do on feed production. But, and this is to answer your question, 
as we get these coops bigger and we have more poultry on pasture, what we're looking at is these models of integration into row crop rotation. So in the same way that you'd rotate, you know, in Georgia, wheat into cotton, into beans, and then you'd fallow and then you'd come back and, and that's all great. What we're seeing is we can take three years of that row crop field, put it into a temporary pasture setup, run poultry on it, potentially transition it into organic, hypercharge that soil with all the nitrogen and phosphorus. And phosphorus is something we can talk about because if you stay with poultry on the model that we have for 10 or 20 years, you're going to have too much phosphorus in the soil eventually. But our model is we want to be there for three to five years and we want to move. Uh, and then the, the row crops can come in behind us and we'll go take on another highly degraded section of land, put it into pasture and we'll run the birds there. So I think that this plant animal integration is a unique, maybe not, but what I was going to say is a unique thing that you can do at scale to jump onto these large corn and bean row crop farms. And I think start to crack this code of regenerative grain production done at scale as well. I don't want to act like we're there yet, but it seems like that's part of the solution is getting animals integrated back into plant operations and getting plants integrated back into animal operations. Um, they've been largely segregated for the last 60 or 70 years of industrial ag in our country. But I think that that's something that's worth talking about. It's an interesting topic, if nothing else. So on several occasions, you've mentioned or commented that you're you're still figuring pieces out, um, that you're you're still figuring out the future business strategy, but also you're still figuring out the the system uh, of the arc and its various engineering components. What significant challenges do you have that you'd like to resolve yet? We really feel that we have the coop figured out. And that sounds cocky and it sounds egotistical, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to be honest with things. We noticed massive change with every iteration for the first two or three years. Now, as we build new ones, the changes get smaller and smaller, which usually means you're getting closer to, you know, um, you're never going to have a perfect model. But I think you're getting closer to a replicable, scalable model that's worth building. Um, but I mean, we're on version six or seven or something of, of the arc. As far as where kind of the challenges still lie with the business model, I know it sounds really stupid, but a lot of it now comes back to telling our story and marketing how we're different. You can't have a business if people don't know how you're different. And so on a small farm, local scale, sometimes that's easier. As we jump into the grocery store, I don't have a direct relationship with any of, of the people who are shopping at Sprouts for our product, right? So now... It's this very weird full circle thing where now we're spending a lot of time on packaging, on presentation, on point of sale materials, on social media and email marketing and trying to explain to these people that may only have one touch point with us or they may just see us in the supermarket. How is this different than free range or how is it different than the highly greenwash pasture raised label that is very easy to slap onto anything? How is this different than regenerative or how is it regenerative or what does that word even mean? So it's, it's now, I would say the challenge is largely becoming, not that there's not operational challenges, there always is, and there always will be, but now how is it, how do you get the consumer to pick this up and understand that it's different uh, and to pay more for it? I was going to go in a different direction, but the last two words that you said, the last three words that you said gave me pause. Um, so I think it's important to touch base on that. As we commented, you were within striking distance on labor costs and capex costs. But uh, what is the retail shelf price compared to industry standard? We use Sprouts as a really good example. You know, Sprouts is definitely not a cheap grocery store, but it's definitely not a super expensive grocery store. It's somewhere in that middle to upper end where people are shopping there because they want organics, they want more natural products, they want whole foods, but it's not, you know, a tiny little health food store that's really just ridiculously expensive. They're bigger, they've got several hundred stores, they're an efficient operator. And so where we end up, for example, on a whole chicken, where maybe the conventional commodity whole chicken might be $1.99 a pound, the organic chicken might net out at, you know, $3.99 a pound, we're going to be in between those two. 
that's an industrial sort of industrial organic chicken that we're coming in under. In a lot of ways, I think what we're doing is highly differentiated from the industrial organic system. We are not certified organic. We do not feed certified organic. We do a non-GMO feed, which is still not cheap. Uh, we run the Cornish cross breed, but we're truly raising them on pasture. And we have a lot of good studies about the nutrient density um, differences, the you know higher, higher omega-3, much higher kind of vitamin A and E, lower saturated fat, a lot of these micronutrients that people would take in pill form that you can actually get from your food if you're eating food that's you know, eating a natural diet, living a natural way. So I think the value is really there where we're priced right now. And we're seeing the product just tear it up in retail. I mean, it's doing wonderfully in retail, but a lot of that's because of the marketing and the packaging. If you don't have that, people don't know what you're doing. And so it's just weird because for 10 years, I was like the anti-packaging guy. I was like, do what's right at the farm level. The consumers will know we're going to host and we've hosted 30,000 people for farm tours and we're really big on transparency and, you know, inspect what you expect and all these things. But you get to a certain level where that's actually not possible anymore. And now spending all this money on packaging and design and graphic arts, and it's just, it feels really weird, but I think it is part of the equation at this, at this point. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So as I'm listening and thinking about what you're the enterprise that you're describing, it occurs to me that you have kind of a, a magical opportunity. This is the nexus point. I know that there are thousands of farmers across the Midwest who are listening to this podcast who are not young anymore. They're in their 40s or 50s or perhaps even older. And they have a desire to uh, begin approaching a regenerative transition Dealing with beef seems to be more than they can handle that they can take on from a labor perspective. And chicken has not been an option for them previously because it either is A, not regenerative, or B, uh, the labor pool just simply isn't accessible and isn't available. And you've resolved those challenges. So now there are going to be hundreds or maybe thousands of farmers asking the question, well, hey, I love this idea. How can I get started? And uh, where can I go? I want one of these arcs. How do I make that happen? I wish I had a better answer for that because, man, how I would love to be in the Midwest and to be, you know, running on corn and bean fields and being part of that integration. Sadly, one of the big limiting factors of the poultry business, unlike cattle, is that you need to be very close to your um, processing. You can't drive chickens 10, 12 hours like you can cattle. So it really limits the geography um, where we can actually do this business. And so our entire operation is currently based about an hour and a half south of Atlanta, Georgia. We find that to be a climate where we can be year round, but also cost effective for years and years. We were in Southern California. The problem with that is land prices and, and it just doesn't rain. And so it's trying to have you know, a pasture based operation in Southern California is super challenging for obvious reasons. But I would say there's two answers to it. One, if you're listening to this and you're in you know, that that part of the world in Georgia, south of Atlanta, you've got row crops, you're interested in a pasture poultry, large scale pasture poultry integration, call me, it's Paul at pasturebird.com. Uh, and, and I'd love to talk. There's a lot of opportunity in that part of the world. If you're in the Midwest, there's not a lot I can personally do to help. But I hope that the principles that we're talking about may inspire a collaboration with another livestock farmer or maybe a poultry farmer or have somebody else come in and maybe run beef or lambs on your land. I mean, I just think that that confluence of plants and animals is the future and past of agriculture. And I think it, it's likely where we're heading to on the regenerative side. This has been a really awesome conversation, but it's been very focused. And I know there are other pieces that we could speak about as well. One of the topics that I saw you post on some time ago that really caught my attention. Uh, one of my one of my heroes or inspirations has been uh, Booker T. Watley, How to Make $100,000 on 25 Acres, published back in, I don't know, 1940 or 1960 or something like that. I forget exactly when. And you started sharing, I don't know if you read the book or uh, similar books or where your inspiration came from, but you started sharing some very interesting thoughts on, on uh shared ownership and, and uh, community collaboration in uh, food 
production and processing and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about that. Where, uh, what has your journey been in, uh, in those ideas? You know, you're the first guy I've ever talked to that knew that knows Booker T. Watley. I know that his name's out there, but I can't believe he's not more prominent than he is because his ideas are just on point for what we're dealing with right now. And so this is almost like taking the pasture bird hat off and, uh, and going back to the family farm and kind of talking about some of the other things that uh, the other irons that are in the fire right now. Part of me felt like especially as we move the farm out of California, where I live, and now it's in Georgia, you know, I don't have that farm that I can go and kind of be on all the time and be around it all the time. I mean, the soil and just kind of being around plants and animals is, is in my blood now. And so I have to be around it. We were able to pick up a 30 acre urban farm here in Southern California after we started working with Purdue. And my family decided we'd never been able to own land before. And so this is the first time we've ever been able to actually own our own land. And we've always wanted to do something with trees and animals combined. So this agroforestry or silvopasture kind of model where you're running animals through the orchard lanes. And it was just a bit of a bummer as we moved the farm out of California and moved it to Georgia. And it was just very clear that California, the economics didn't make sense for doing large scale pasture poultry. All of our dairies are leaving. It seems like agriculture is just fleeing this part of the world as fast as it can. And I came back to this idea of the SWOT analysis, and it's something that Joel Salatin taught me a long time ago, is there is no bad or good place to farm. It's about matching your business model up to your geography and to the strengths and weaknesses that you have in your area. And so we started thinking, well, what if large-scale pasture poultry doesn't work, what model of agriculture would work in this highly populated area where you have a lot of expendable income, and a lot of people who care about health, but land cost is super high and water is pretty hard to come by. And we came back to Booker T. Watley's writings about clientele membership clubs and, you know, community style marketing and really back to this idea of you pick. And I know it sounds weird, probably, especially being in, in a rural part of Ohio or depending on where you are, this is going to sound like a crazy idea, but it's really about matching the opportunity with the population. And so we came back to this idea and it's just now sort of getting off the ground of a community-based, membership-based um, UPIC model. And so we have about an acre planted in organic fruit and nut trees. And there's about 150 families that have signed up for a monthly membership payment. They get to come out three days a week. Uh, it's all you can eat while you're here as part of your membership payment. And then it's a super, super discounted price for anything that you take away. And in this climate, we have 12 month gro growing season. So we have, I mean, every stone fruit you can think of, we can grow citrus, we have blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, we have a winter garden in right now that's going to have, you know, carrots and celery and cucumbers and sugar snap peas and all these things that start harvesting in December, January outside. And we don't harvest anything. A uh, hundred percent of the harvest is done by hand by the members. And um, a big part of me thinks that this model has legs in other geographies as well, but it's largely going to be around community centers and more urban settings than your traditional sort of row crop farm or anything, obviously. And then the community ownership piece becomes really interesting too. So if you remember 20 years ago, if you wanted to buy a stock in Apple, you had to go and save up the whatever, 500 or $800 to go buy your one share. But what happened really with like Robinhood and some of these other fractional ownership models, and it's really what the public markets are in general, with the stock market in general, is more than one person can own land. And one of the biggest failure points, I think, for regenerative ag is the finance structures around it. In the Amish and Mennonite community, I think you guys have it solved much better than we do kind of on the, in the English context, if you will. But we don't have a good model. We have a largely absentee owner system. We have a bunch of people leasing land that don't care about what the land looks like 30 years from now. And you have these owners that also kind of are disincentivized to do regenerative ag. And so I haven't seen successful regenerative farm finance models really take place yet. 
But I think fractional ownership and community ownership can be a way for people to incentivize regenerative without you know, massive amount of debt where you're cash poor and you have this huge mortgage and you're stressed out all the time. And I think that people want to own part of these operations. And as, and so we're really working on this idea of fractional or tokenized really ownership where you can come in and you can own as a silent passive investor, you could own 1% or 2% of a land base. And as that property improves over time, the value is going to go up over time and your investment is going to be worth more over time. It's really the same idea that the stock market has. Oftentimes, a growth stock doesn't pay a dividend because the most efficient use of that capital is not giving it back to the investors. It's reinvesting it into the company to try to grow the overall value long term. And people can buy and sell as they need the money and they can get in and out. And I think that that same model should and could be overlaid into regenerative farms. And I think that that's a, a really viable way to fund regenerative farming. I love that idea. Actually, I'm going to go back to the community harvest model, and then we want to talk further about fundraising. I think, as you noted, and obviously there is the requirement to be a geographic and geographic proximity to a large population center. Yeah. But my sense is that farmers simultaneously appreciate and yet ignore the significant line item that is labor costs related to harvest. Yeah. In the fresh fruit and vegetable world, it's depending on which crop you're speaking about, it's not uncommon for that to be 30 to 40% of your total budget, harvest yep. labor specifically. And you can remove 100% of that by having it be harvested locally, like people in the field harvesting their own. But you actually can reduce your price by more than 30 to 40%. It's uh, it's a case of, what's the word, margin versus markup that I'm looking for. All of a sudden, you're, you have such significantly reduced cost that you can actually reduce your retail price point even greater than the 40% and still be much better ahead financially from an operational perspective and without all the stress that is uh, can be associated with those those really tight margins. So anyway, yeah. Well, especially because I've got 150 families currently paying me $60 a month to be part of the farm. And I know that number is going to sound insane in the Midwest. It's not going to be the same number everywhere. But think about what that does for the overall farm cash flow. And something that we've learned that I thought was an interesting learning, I mean, we're in year two of the orchard. There's not a lot of fruit out there yet, right? And so a lot of people are going to go, oh, this is just Southern California. This wouldn't work in my context. That's fine. Take it or leave it. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know your context. But what we've done is we've really combined recreation and agriculture together as well. So we've really invested in play structures and rope swings. We put a soccer field on the farm. We have a pickleball field. We have all these interesting things so that families are more incentivized to come out and spend time. We have a lot of homeschoolers in our area. And instead of sitting at their house, they'll come out and they'll do homeschool from the farm. They'll come out and they'll do picnics. They'll do community get-togethers. And 60 bucks a month is a steal. You need to up your price. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, I'm glad you think so. I don't, I don't know that everybody thinks that, but um, we're doing something currently called an early bird membership too, where we know it's going to be 150 or 180. And again, we're in Southern California, so leave it, call, take it or leave it. But we're trying to reward the early adopters that are taking a place that doesn't have a lot of fruit production yet. We don't have, you know, it's not really dialed and really beautiful, but I mean, they're going to keep this $60 rate for the lifetime of their membership. And so as there is a bunch of fruit and as everybody else comes in behind them paying that 180 a month, they're always going to be grandfathered at that early bird rate. And so that's how we're trying to incentivize some of that early cash flow. This farm Again, not passion bird. This is a totally different thing that we're talking about now. It's also 100% off grid. And so we're in a very water restricted environment, but we have really high producing wells and we put those wells onto 100% solar. And so our cost of production is unbelievably low. If you're able to just cover the mortgage, I mean, it's really the cost of the seeds and the weed. And what's crazy about that, we charged people just last week. 
$15 each to come out and be part of a planting workshop where we taught them for about an hour around tables. And then they went out and they did all the planting for us. So it's a, it's an interesting model. I have a new nickname for you. I'm going to call you Tom Sawyer the <laughs> second. I mean, it's going to sound like swindling to some people, but you have to remember, especially here in Southern California, where people live in high rises and they don't have a yard and they're dying for community and they want to be around exactly. other like-minded people and they want to get their hands dirty and they want to have the farm experience without necessarily having to own or manage their own farm. Exactly. So you're giving people a huge value, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I I resonate with that very strongly. I was I was joking and, uh, and razzing with you a little bit there, but absolutely the 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 aspects of relationships and having a connection to life and the living processes is so crucial. There is this deep need within our soul for that, and it's absent in many people's lives in the cities. Yeah, on Monday we're going to try this for the first time, and this is kind of my this is not necessarily my thing, but it's my family's thing. A turkey you pick. And so I think this may, may be popular uh, in the Northeast, but people are going to come out. They're going to pick out their turkey from the field and they're basically going to get a demonstration on how to process it. And then they're going to have a chance to do their own um, Thanksgiving turkey from the field. And that sounds like a fun and maybe kind of gimmicky thing, but it's really this idea of building a really resilient food system um, that's not reliant on the USDA, not having a bunch of government involvement, not you know, if something crap was to ever really hit the fan, we would like to be able to feed our membership and, and our people. And uh, part of that is obviously processing your own meat. So that should be a pretty fun thing to do next Monday. That sounds, uh, I think I would call it entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's come back to the uh, the shared ownership piece, because this is this is something that really strikes at the heart of regenerating relationships. I was really inspired roughly a decade or more ago upon reading what I just generically referred to as the Harvard study on long longevity. And it's so well known that if you search for that, you'll probably find it. But the essence of this lifelong study that is now still ongoing, the study is ongoing after 80 years, there's new cohorts of people that have been brought into it. The fundamental essence is that when you get to the end of life or even during your life, what gives you longevity, what gives you satisfaction, what gives you a sense of fulfillment is not the wealth that you've generated. It's not right. the success that you've had in the world. It's the depth and quality of your close relationships, particularly wow. family and close, close friends. And so when you think about that, that gave me a whole new, like I, I had the privilege of growing up in the Amish community. I'm still a member of the Amish community. And when you're a part of a community like this, uh, and particularly as I traveled uh, around the world and got to meet lots of people and develop many close friendships outside of that community, and then come back, you develop a fresh perspective on what it actually means to be a community. And I would say that from my perspective, from where I sit, most people in the world today, or in, in the US and uh, the people that I get exposed to, don't really have any sense of what it means to be in community with each other and to really participate and to really contribute. Because the reality is uh, to make a community successful, it can't be about what you receive. It is exclusively about what you contribute. What do you contribute Absolutely. to a community? And uh, we're actually, we're going through this process right now at uh, Advancing Eco Agriculture where uh, we're fundraising through a community fundraising round, a crowdfunding Reg CF and a Reg D fundraising round. Nice. Specifically because uh, uh, there were various motives and factors that were driving it, but the one significant piece that was really driving it is I wanted to provide a pathway for uh, to not just be a company that does regenerative, but to be a company that is regenerative and has regenerative relationships baked right into its DNA. Yeah. And so how can we have our customers and our employees and our supporters and all the people who are a are, who are contributors to our growth and development as an organization, how can we have them participate in our growth and success as we continue to evolve? And we explored 
lots of different possibilities and options, but the short version is that this was an administratively easy pathway for us to be able to accomplish that and to facilitate that. And so when you think about having these types of relationships where your customers are not just customers, it's no longer a transactional relationship, but they are now also co-owners. You, you change the dynamics, you change the nature of the relationship, and all of a sudden you are in community with, with people. And, you know, when I think about, I would put forward the hypothesis that the idea that you've come up with, uh, or that you are articulating, not necessarily that it's originated with you, but the idea that you are articulating is an idea that is, that may be unappetizing to most existing landowners. Yeah, I think so. Because they don't, they don't need it. They don't need community. They think. They think they don't need community. The people who are open to this idea and who would brainstorm as you have done are people who want to develop a pathway for them to be able to farm for them to have access to land and it is those people who need community and so i know i'm on a bit of a soapbox here but well i'm on it with you i mean i, I think yeah it's absolutely comes back to community and being part of something bigger than yourself and it's like i think it was jfk uh, ask not you know what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I think it's a lot of those same principles. Yeah. Ask not what your community can do for you. And, you know, I'll take this thought one step further, which is to say that for many existing farmers, there is this strong attachment to land. Like this is my land. You think I'm going to right. sell a right. part ownership in my farm? Like that is anathema. Yeah. Do you desire community? What are you willing to contribute to truly participate as a part of a community that deeply cares about each other? Uh, you know, <clears throat> there's, I'll give one example. Like there's, there's a few examples of, of what community really means within the Amish community that are more visible to the outside world. And the, the example that is perhaps most iconic or most widely recognized is that of a barn raising. Yep. And I've had the privilege of participating in several where a fire happens and someone's dairy barn burns down and people are just amazed. I participated in one that happened in January in the middle of the winter. It was blitz cold. Everything was freezing. The new foundations were poured and the block walls were laying before the, before the burn piles had quit smoking. Literally. And I think it was like, I think it was a 90, 96 hours after the fire started, they were milking cows in the new dairy barn. Wow. And that is, that's a very iconic expression of community, but what I also see happening is here in the community when, uh, when there is a death, the family is responsible for nothing except making decisions about how they want the arrangements to be taken care of. The community pitches in and does everything, literally takes care of all the arrangements, does everything for them. And every day, there's usually a three-day period uh, between the death and when the funeral is held, and there are thousands of people that show up every day, the entire day for visitation. It's like that, that is something that most people don't get to experience. And we all lose for that. Everyone loses. But to get that, it's not about what we can receive. And like, I have to be paid for this land. I have to control the land. It's like, oh, what are you willing to contribute to participate and to be a part of a community like that? I, I had a chance to drive through. I mean, this is totally a tangent, but I was, I was driving from Philadelphia up to, up to upstate New York about two, three months ago. I've always, frankly, been really interested in Amish culture, Mennonite culture, and the why behind it. Not the, you know, Hollywood version of it, but but really what's what's going on there as a Christian and, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, basically. And, uh, and I, I took a really deep dive and I just walked away from that drive through Lancaster County and everything going, They've got their, I mean, there's faults just like anybody, obviously, but there is so much gold here that I think we can learn from. And I just was like, I got to find an Amish friend and I want to bring my family out there. And I just want to, I just want to observe for, you know, a month and just be able to work <laughs> alongside. Cause I, I just think whether you're Amish or not, doesn't matter. It's, it's, there is so much wisdom in the community part of the culture that's there. I mean, it's just, it, it's beautiful. Well, you now have your in. You're welcome to come anytime, and I can introduce you to hundreds of people. Oh, that would be so cool. So cool. Yeah, well, I'm right there with you, especially on the community piece of it. I also had this epiphany of 
strictly financially. Now that I'm a landowner, I never have been before, but as of a couple of years ago, I own land. Cool, really interesting. But what would you rather, purely financially, would you rather own 100% of your land or would you rather own 80% of your land and 2% of 10 other farms that are being managed really well, like Joel's, like Will's, like yours. I mean, people that I know that are going to do a good job. What's better? Have everything tied up in one place or to have most of my stuff tied up in mine, but be able to have a little piece of a bunch of other ones. And I just thought I would so much rather give up a little bit of mine and be able to invest in a bunch of other ones. It just feels like the difference of owning one stock or owning a whole bunch of different stocks and no financial advisor would tell you to just own one stock, you know? Yeah. Just building on that thought and, and the, some of the previous thoughts that we expressed, I'm not sure quite how to articulate this, but what does it mean to invest in intangibles? What does it mean to invest in a community? Like this type of community giving and sharing is, yeah, the essence is, as you described, it's not what the community can do for you, but what you can do for the community. And, you know, there is this, uh, this verse in the Bible, uh, I forget exactly how it's phrased in, in English, but something to the effect of freely you have received, freely give. And when we think about that, we think about the golden rule. Many people misunderstand the golden rule. The golden rule means do things, do something, yep. take action. It doesn't say don't take any action and wait for other people to not do something to you or to do something to you. Take action, do things that you want other people to do for you. And uh, we know that from a spiritual perspective, what we put out into the world is exactly what we receive back to us multiple times over. And I just have this overwhelming sense that if we collectively as a larger community shared more, and if we as farmers engaged the community more uh, and gave and shared freely with what their needs are, we would receive back so richly. But you know what you can't do? You can't do that if you're only growing corn and beans and you don't even have a garden for your own family. I agree. Yeah. It would require a very different farming model than what a lot of, uh, a lot of what exists right now. In some ways, yes. In other ways, there's so much you can do. Like if you have a desire, you can do it. Yeah. If you really have the desire, it's not difficult to figure out. That's really beautiful. And I think it even speaks to conservation versus being that, like in the beginning of the conversation, we talked about how, what, what is the purpose of humans in the first place? I mean, and I think it's being that active steward and it's, and, and you're right. The golden rule isn't sit back and let other people, you know, be nice to you. It's a do unto others. It's a command. It's, a, it's, it's time to take action. And so I think, yeah, I mean, that, that speaks to our role as human beings in the first place. And, and I think that that's a, a really cool tie in. Now I'm going to, uh, just for the, the final exclamation point on uh, that, this, this dialogue we've been having in the sense of do unto others. Do you really, would you really desire others to coat your food in toxins, to constantly be spraying pesticides, to be polluting groundwater, to be degrading landscapes? I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but anyway, you got me rolling a little bit. So I think <laughs> we're, we're reaching a good point for a, a natural conclusion to this conversation. Paul, I want to thank you for being here and for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge. I want to say thank you for all the, uh, the work that you're doing. I really have a lot of gratitude because I... Uh, I'm excited to see you get to a million birds a week. You said that you think that's very far away, but uh, I'm optimistic that it might be a lot closer than you might think. Yeah, I think I think it's coming. I really do. I mean, the, the foundation is certainly laid now, and that's just a number. I mean, what I really want to do is just steward the opportunity that, that God's going to give us, and whatever that turns into is fine. But that number has been on me and, and my team's mind for a long time, and it does seem like that's going to be it's going to be a reachable goal sometime in the in the future. So. All right. Thank you, Paul. Talk to you again soon. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess. We test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. 
We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.